Uh, my name is Baird Linky, and I'm excited to be here to talk about trail running with you. Uh, as this presentation is going on, it's not super set in stone, so feel free to fire off any questions that you have in the chat box below. Uh, there's a little bit of a delay between what I say and what shows up on the chat, so bear that in mind. As people are coming in, if you want to just introduce yourself down in the chat box and let me know if there's anything in particular that you'd like to learn about today, uh, feel free to do that. And we'll get started in earnest as people start trickling in in the next couple minutes. So by way of introduction, while we're waiting for people to get settled in, my name is Baird. I work here at Midwest Mountaineering. I am a sales associate in the boats and skis department, and I also uh, work as the social media manager here. I've been a runner since I was, gosh, 11 years old, something like that. So over a decade and a half of running now. Wow, that's wild to think about. Um, but that's uh, some of my background. I started running where I grew up in Helena, Montana. Uh, the trail systems out there are great, wonderful place to learn how to run. I ran in middle school, high school, college. I uh, ran cross country and track. So I've got experience on that competitive end as well as a more recreational runner. Uh, trail running has always been one of my uh, preferred outdoor activities. Uh, my dog is under the table and it's one of his as well. Uh, actually, if there's no one else in this room, I can take that right off. And uh, running has always been the place that I can find a little bit of peace and quiet for myself and the trails more so than most other places. Let's see, we've got a few folks showing up. So as we're thinking about getting into trail running, and you might have experienced this yourself, when you share that you enjoy an activity like trail running, a question that's very helpfully and thoughtfully asked is often, what's wrong with you? Well, there's a few answers that you can give to that uh, if you're looking for them. On a practical level, trail running is a little bit better for your body. The surface that you're running on is softer. Also, the terrain is more varied, which means that you're engaging more muscles over a longer period of time which kind of reduces the risk of long-term use injuries. Uh, helps to keep all those muscles firing instead of overusing one set in particular. It's also a little bit safer on the end if there's no cars to hit you. Uh, and that's, you know, worth something. The other risks involved with trail running might kind of balance that out, but it's true. And it's an argument that you can say. Uh, on a more abstract level, and this is some of my more personal uh, stuff coming through on it. I like that trail running is quiet. I like that it's a little bit dirty and it doesn't have to be all nice and put together. I also feel often when I'm running in the cities uh, that it can feel a little bit like you're on display. You're out there for everyone to see and the voice in the back of my head is always wondering whether or not I, I look fast enough or um, whether I'm looking like I'm struggling as much as I'm feeling. And when you're trail running, there's less of that to deal with. It's uh, really a personal time for you to be out on the trail in your body and experiencing it that way. And so those are some of the advantages that I find with trail running. And I think that most people who've uh, experienced trail running will enjoy that too. Also with more varied terrain, you have prettier views and a little bit more excitement going on. Uh, often people struggle with running because it is a pretty repetitive activity and they need something to occupy their minds. Trail running is a great way to get into that. Just checking this chat real quick. Um, and again, if you're uh, kind of popping in to explore, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Let me know if there's anything in particular that you would like to learn. This presentation is put together, but it's not set in stone. And I'm happy to respond to folks who are here instead of the folks that I had imagined while I was putting this together. When you're getting ready to start running trails, uh, there are some just practical matters that you want to get out of the way first and foremost, and most of those revolve around wardrobe. And as in most situations, when you're talking about wardrobe, that's shoes, short uh, bottoms, and tops. Uh, most of the time, you're just going to want to go with what's comfortable. Trail running is wonderful because it isn't a very expensive activity to get into, fairly accessible for everyone. The most expensive piece of equipment that you're going to have are shoes, and we'll talk about those later. As you start to explore and get to know yourself a little bit better as a runner, you might start finding things that you uh, appreciate a little bit more from your wardrobe. You'll learn what feels comfortable for you under different weather conditions, and that'll help you kind of round that out. Generally speaking, what I recommend for folks is to have 
a few pairs of shorts that you can rotate through. Uh, usually having some kind of liner in there is a good way to prevent chafing underneath. Uh, have those be lightweight. I recommend having a pair of tights for colder weather. Um, if tights are uncomfortable for you or you prefer something that's a little bit baggier, then sweatpants do great. Um, in all of these situations, I really recommend using a synthetic fabric of some kind that's going to wick moisture away from you and isn't going to start getting rougher as it gets wet, especially uh, when you're doing so many repetitions of the same motion, chafing can be a real issue. So choosing fabrics that are going to help avoid those sorts of situations is going to be important. On the top layer, kind of the same deal. Try to avoid cotton. It's going to really soak up sweat and be uncomfortable. It'll also start to rub. Uh, especially as you start getting into colder weather, that cotton is not going to help insulate you very well, and it's actually going to make it a bit colder for you to be out and about while you're out there. Um, windbreaker that has some kind of lightweight water resistance is also a great thing to have in your arsenal. So if you're going out on days that are less than ideal, then you have at least another layer that's going to keep the wind off of your skin. And usually that's all that you need. You're going to be running and generating enough heat with your body that if you can keep the air from kind of robbing that heat from you with the windbreaker, that's going to be a great place to go. And it's a lightweight option that's not going to make you feel like you're being kind of suffocated while you're out there. We've got special occasions. That's as you're starting to specialize as a runner, starting to explore different areas that might involve getting a hydration pack, might involve getting some night gear if that's the time of the day that you have uh, the time to actually get out, having something reflective so that you're visible, um, easy to find, just getting to the trailhead and out and about. A lightweight headlamp is something that folks often invest in. And depending on the activities that you're getting into, you might start finding that maybe having a pair of trekking poles with you is going to be useful or uh, carrying a first aid kit, something like that, uh, just to be well-rounded and prepared for whatever run you're going into. As you've started to develop as a runner and you've got a little bit more confidence about what you're doing out there, you'll start to figure out what pieces you're missing based off of what's annoying to you when you're out there and things that you kind of wish that you had. So that is something that you can start talking about uh, with sales associates or folks who know a thing or two about that. As you start developing, chat with other trail runners uh, that you might know and kind of get their take on something if you're thinking that it might be time to invest in a hydration system that you're spending enough time out there then that might be necessary. Generally speaking, once your runs start to get towards the hour and above length, that's when you might wanna consider bringing water with you. And if you're out there for multiple hours, you definitely should have some hydration system with you while you're out and about. Um, up until that point though, uh, it can be nice to have around, but it might also just be another moving part that you don't really need to engage with while you're doing your running. So I talked to you, I mentioned that we were going to have a deeper conversation about shoes. I'm sorry, my dog is digging in the carpet. Come on. Thank you. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about now. This is the most important part of your running equipment. And we're going to walk through a little bit of the considerations that you're going to want to have in mind when you're picking out a shoe for yourself. So when I'm talking about shoes with folks, I like people to consider Kind of running that they've done are you a beginner have you had some experience on roads and you're starting to dabble in the trails are you an experienced runner just looking to re-up and that's going to kind of help us narrow down the questions that need to be answered uh, for the sake of the presentation we're going to assume that everyone involved is a beginner and we'll move from there so we've got the anatomy of the running shoe down there uh, for you to take a look at the main things that we're going to be talking about as far as trail running goes are going to have to do with the sole of the shoe, specifically these parts, which are called the lugs. These are what bite into the trail, uh, same as the lugs on a tire. Uh, we're going to talk about the stiffness of the sole. This is a, a particularly flexible shoe. We're going to talk about the toe box, which is this space right here. That's going to be important when we're talking about your biomechanics and how your body is adapting to that. We're also going to talk a lot about, going to hold this in front of me, going to talk a lot about the heel. Uh, many running shoes are built with what's called a, a heel drop, which means that there is a significant difference between the height of the heel portion down to the toe. So your foot is at a little bit of an angle, you're a bit raised up. Uh, that can work for some runners, especially folks who have uh, differences in like the length of their legs, which is a pretty common thing. 
Uh, for many people though, they prefer a zero drop shoe, which means that the height on one end is the same as the other. That's my personal preference. And the few reasons for that are that it avoids running into the situation where you're taking your body out of its natural alignment. It's just giving you an extra barrier, some extra traction between your foot and the ground, but it's not changing the angles or anything of the mechanics of your body. You may have heard uh, things about minimalist shoes, which are shoes that are designed to be as little barrier between your foot and the ground as possible. There's some logic behind that. The human foot was evolved <laughs> for actually running and not for walking around in shoes. So shoes are a relatively recent invention relative to that. And your shoes are not necessarily set up well for you to run in the most natural stride. So the minimalist shoe, the logic behind that is to take out as much of the modern attachments to the foot and allow the foot to do what it's designed to do. So the bony architecture of the foot is designed to splay out and absorb shock that way and then snap back up into its arch. And minimalist shoes allow that to happen, whereas a more built up shoe is going to kind of take care of that shock absorption just from the architecture of the shoe itself. I am interested in the the arguments for minimalist shoes i'm less compelled by the anecdotes you may have heard about people who struggle with chronic injuries or something like that switching to minimalist shoes and all of a sudden their injuries are gone and they never had to worry about it again because their body fell perfectly into alignment and they were running just peachy keen from there those stories happen i'm not saying that they're they're lying by any means but that isn't a compelling reason to switch into a minimalist shoe, especially because for most people, the supportive muscles that are going to help keep your body in alignment, help absorb shock and distribute that well through your body aren't really well uh, fortified. And so going from a built up shoe like most of us wear on a day to day basis, whether that's running or just around town, you're going to move into something that has no support and all of a sudden those muscles that haven't had to work very hard are going to be overtaxed and the muscles that are doing the majority of your work aren't going to be supported and you might find yourself getting injured. So if minimalism is something that you're interested in or you want to transition into something like a zero drop shoe, which is kind of a middle ground between a traditional trainer and a minimalist shoe, it uh, has features of both. I recommend doing that slowly over time. So pick a period where you're not training for a particular goal. Give yourself the time to actually make that transition. Start with low, low mileage, just to feel how your body reacts to those minimalist shoes or zero drop shoes. See what you're noticing, what parts of your body are sore that weren't sore uh, before. And think about ways that you can really care for those parts of your body as you're making that transition, if that's something that you want to do. That gets us a little bit into the question of what kind of running will you enjoy? And that's also going to uh, make a difference for the shoe that you're looking at. For myself, I could imagine myself really enjoying running these long trails in the Pyrenees in Italy and having a great time out there for days at a time, never touching pavement. That sounds great. I would enjoy that a lot. Reality is I'm probably not going to spend that much time out there. So I'm going to be looking for a shoe that might be able to straddle both some trail runs and runs on asphalt. The, when I mentioned the stiffness of the shoe, this is where that becomes really important. Super stiff trail shoes or ones with very big lugs uh, are going to be designed to spend most of your time on dirt. And they could be pretty uncomfortable and not very helpful when you're running on asphalt. The idea is that it's going to protect your foot from all of these varied surfaces, especially kind of sharp rocks or uh, sticks and things that might be a bit of an issue for you out there as you're landing between two rocks and it's kind of a weird space in between helps to distribute that weight. That's all going to be really helpful while you're on the trail. But if you take a shoe that is that stiff and put it onto a road condition where the ground is a lot harder and it's the same motion over and over again, that impact is going to be distributed pretty directly through your legs and your hips and could actually start to be uncomfortable and even dangerous for your body over time. You might be experiencing a lot of wear that you weren't counting on. So thinking about the running that you'll enjoy is great and could be a helpful way to talk about goal setting, which we'll get into at a later point. I think the most important thing is to think about what is the running that you're actually going to do, and then we can move from there. Ideally, running is something that you'd be able to start and then you'll evolve over time. You'll, you'll be doing it enough that you'll be able to have a lot of adaptation. 
So thinking in the time horizon, the life of a particular shoe, uh, generally speaking, a super well-built trainer, um, thinking of a lot of the things that uh, Asics or Brooks puts out, uh, those are gonna last about four to 500 miles of running. Something like the Superior here from Ultra is built to be a little bit lighter weight, have a little bit less cushion in it. That's gonna last maybe around 300 miles. So that gives you kind of an idea of the time horizon that you're working with. And if the running that you really want to do is further out, you might have to consider. I just saw the question show up in the chat. Good indicator that you need to replace your shoe. Uh, that's a really good question. For me, one thing that I'm really paying attention to is if you are noticing that you've got some twinges and pains in parts of your body, especially around your shins or your knees uh, or your hips that have been feeling fine up until that point, then I would, might start looking at the bottom of your shoes and see if you're landing a little bit off. Often, uh, you'll be able to see wear patterns on your shoes over a period of time. Generally, that's going to be on the outsole right here, kind of on the edge of your foot and, and or on the heel. If you're landing a lot on your heel, especially in a thinner shoe, you should really consider either changing your form or going up to a more cushioned shoe in the back. If you're landing on the forefoot towards the toes, then you've got the whole splay of the foot to absorb that shock. If you're landing on the heel, you have just one hard point and then all of the impact is going straight up from there. So you're going to want to be able to cushion that a little bit more, and that's where you would go with a more cushioned shoe. Either way, you'll be able to see where you're landing most heavily. And as you start getting through, you can see there's a couple different layers of rubber here. This is the foam cushion layer, and this is just the outer gripping layer of rubber. Once you've actually worn through that gripping layer and start cutting away at the foam layer underneath, you're going to start thinking that it's time to move into a new shoe. Another thing that you might notice is that shoes tend to blow out a little bit, especially on the outside of the foot. So as the upper starts to separate from the sole of the shoe, that might also be an indicator that it's time to revamp. And if that's becoming a problem with you, it personally for me, it took me a while to find shoes that wouldn't blow out that way. I tend to land on the outside of my foot, so I hit that part a lot. You might want to just start thinking about that as you're looking at other shoes because maybe there's still life in the sole of the shoe, but if you've blown that out, it's not going to be doing as good of a job in supporting you as you go. Um, I hope that's helpful. If you want more clarification, let me know in the chat. So we talked a little bit about running form. Um, we'll get back to that in just a second. So we talked about the running that you want to do, the running that you enjoy, and the running that you'll actually do. Here's some tips just to make sure that you have the longevity that you need in order to get to the running that you'll really enjoy, set those goals that you want to uh, take part in, and actually get out there and do the running that you're going to do. So first of all, you're going to want to be listening to your body. Running is a place where you don't have a lot of other distractions, and part of the barrier of entry for a lot of folks is that you really do listen to your body, and often it's telling you to stop that because our bodies like being at rest. And it might take a little bit of time, especially if you're not an experienced runner, to get into the flow where you actually want to go out and run instead of feeling like it's something that you have to do. So especially as you're beginning, I recommend running as much as feels good and not worrying about it. Don't go any farther than that. Run as much as you enjoy and will want to do the next day and let that be what it is. That will build from there. You don't have to just rake yourself over the coals and decide that you're going to be a runner right now and live up to some expectation of what that's meant to be as you're getting started. Start with what feels good and you're a runner. Ta-da, you've done it. Congratulations, you're there. But you are gonna wanna listen to your body as you're starting this. And the important thing that you're gonna wanna learn is the distinction between discomfort and pain. Discomfort is where you're growing and that's, that could be your lungs burning when you're uh, out there and pushing it. It could be just the normal muscular burning that you get. Oftentimes that can be pretty painful, honestly, but you're going to want to learn the difference between that discomfort, which means that you're training, you're pushing your body and it's responding in the right way and pain, which is going to feel more like an injury that generally is less of a burning sensation that you get from muscular strain or up in your chest and your lungs. 
and it's going to be more acute. It might feel kind of throbbing. It might feel uh, sharp. Uh, those are going to be pains that you're going to want to listen to and then adjust from. Might be indicating that you need more rest, which is the like one full half of training is rest. We'll get into that a little bit too. Uh, it might also need, mean that you need to adjust your form just a little bit. So generally speaking, uh, people run in a way that isn't the most well suited for long term running. Uh, people think that just because running is a pretty natural motion for most people to do that they don't need to think about their form that they should just be able to fall into it instinctively. And most people can figure out how to swim from A to B by doggy paddling and kind of thrashing, but that's not really what's going to be helpful for swimming. So that's kind of the same operation that's going on with running is you can get from A to B, that's true, but refining your form is going to make it much more enjoyable and a lot safer for you in the long term. So what good form looks like is generally it's going to be quick strides. So somewhere around if you have a metronome or if you're a musician, thinking about maybe 150 to 160 beats per minute up to 180. That means that you're not kind of jumping through the air and then landing harder than you need to be. Keeping up a high turnover rate on your feet means that you're putting less impact on each stride. It also will often look like running up on the midfoot. So not on the toes, like a sprinter, that's where you're just all the power is going straight to there not back on your heels where all of the impact is directly into that heel bone and going straight up the leg, but on the midfoot, which is kind of the ball of your foot, one way to test this is to stand up as straight as you can, lean forward, and as you start to feel your heel come up off the ground, where you're feeling your weight distributed right behind or on the ball of your foot, that's your midfoot. And that's where you're gonna to wanna to imagine landing as you're running. And it's worth checking in with yourself as you're running. If you're starting to feel some tweaks, maybe a little bit of premature stiffness or soreness, think about where you're landing. And if you can adjust how you're landing on your foot, that could be a good way to adjust that. Uh, you're gonna wanna run upright, not with your chest fully puffed out, but run tall, run in a straight line uh, with good posture and alignment for your spine. That's gonna help your hips be in the right position so that they're not tweaking each time that you take a stride and it's not adding extra strain to all of those supported muscles in your hip complex. Uh, the other thing that you're gonna to wanna to think about is just with your arms. Uh, don't have them up here. I see lots of people running kind of like this, and that's a lot of extra energy to hold them up here. That's not moving you forward. Your arm swing is designed to help you maintain balance as you run, so let them swing. Go from your shoulder back to your hip. Uh, keep your hands loose. No need to make fists out of it. And we're gonna start by just thinking about what feels light and easy and smooth, and that will translate to what feels fast. But you wanna make sure that you've got those first three handled before then. Uh, good rest is gonna be another big part of it. Taking a day off when your body is starting to feel kind of run down, especially when you're noticing pain instead of discomfort, is gonna be really important. The runners who are running every day are generally pretty elite. And you don't need to be doing that, especially early on, in order to be getting good growth from your running. And you'll actually find that you're doing yourself a disservice by running too much too early. This is something that I really struggle with. Uh, I can go out and crank out a really tough run and feel great about it. But then the next day I'm super sore and I don't wanna go out the door again. And that's the kind of thing that you would want to save for a race or a big event. You don't want to do that as a part of your training runs because it doesn't really matter what you can do today if you can't go out and do it again tomorrow. You're not going to get progression that way. So listening to your body when you need rest, giving it that rest, and then being careful on the pacing front that you're not pushing yourself too fast for a given day or too far too early. You want to just kind of be in conversation with your body and checking in often and be ready to adapt. While you're on the trail in particular, this is going to be really important, is you want to run at the pace that is safe for you to do. Trail conditions are going to vary. Uh, one trail might be rocky, one trail might be rooty, one might be wide open, and that's great. But they're also going to change from day to day based off of the weather. Some days it's going to be slick, some days it's going to be dry, maybe even grainy. So just paying attention to what footing is like 
how fast can you go and actually land where you want it to be in ways that are going to keep you upright and moving forward go that fast don't need to push yourself faster than that and this is really important if there's a voice in the back of your head judging you for how fast you're going or not try and ignore that voice or have a conversation with it about why what you're doing is fine pushing yourself into a situation that isn't safe for you isn't going to make you a better runner it's actually going to make it harder for you to run over time and be ready to adapt then so as weather starts changing if it's all of a sudden a lot uh, more risky to be out if there looks like a big storm is rolling in earlier than you expected go back it's fine the trail will be there the next day and we want to make sure that you're able to do that as well um and then you can listen to your heart what feels good about running and i'm using heart metaphorically why do you want to run generally speaking people will want to run because they want to lose weight they want to feel fit and those are all great side effects of running i love the runner's high i like how my body feels when it's active all of that's great stuff if i'm running because i want to be the kind of person who runs that's fuel that burns out pretty quick pretty early and i'm not going to maintain my my ability to get out the door very well with that so run for your own reasons and if that reason is that you like having a body and you like moving it out in the world it's going to be a lot more enticing to go running than being resentful about the body that you have and thinking that you want it to be different and you're just trying to form it that way start with just enjoying moving outside and being in the world um, that's going to be a much more sustainable way to run and if on a day you're like man i just don't feel like running that's fine <laughs> Take the day off, find another way to be active. Just because you're a runner and you are a runner doesn't mean that that's the only thing that you do. So give yourself the freedom to run what feels right to you. As you start getting into the later stages of a training program, running for a goal is totally fine. But especially if you're just starting out, run as much as it takes for you to learn how to love it and don't run more than that. The love for the running is going to be a lot more sustainable than any goal that you put out there, but the goals are going to be helpful for maintaining that progression and uh, feeling like you're engaged with it. That's how we get into how to keep it up. So we talked a little bit earlier about how important that hip complex is, how running with good posture is going to be important for keeping everything aligned. That is the most important thing to be working out. Um, and it's kind of the least exciting part of being a runner. Uh, people want to get out there and do the fast stuff. They want to climb the big hills. They want to feel like a big runner, work out their quads and their calves. That's great. You really need to work out your hips as well. That's going to build the stabilizing muscles. That's going to make it possible for you to maintain a higher level of training and be able to get out day after day. If your hips are weak and you're uh, kind of out of alignment as you're running, you're going to put a lot of strain on parts of your body that you wouldn't think should feel that way. Your knees are going to start to feel a lot of wear and tear, not because of the friction of the running, but because the tendons and the ligaments that are holding your knee together are getting pulled and they have to overcompensate for what your hips should be able to do in absorbing that impact. So some exercises that are going to be useful for that, and you can incorporate bands into these to make them more difficult as you go. Lots of clamshells, so that's lying on your side, having your knees stacked and opening like a clam from side to side. Uh, doing some uh, bridges where you lie on your back, lift your hips up to the, to the ceiling with your feet stacked underneath you and have the weight on your feet and on your shoulders. That's going to strengthen the back part of your hips as well as a few of the connectors on the front. Um, leg lifts. You can do that either as like the fire hydrant move that you like imagine a dog being on a fire hydrant, get down on all fours, lift your leg out that way. Uh, or you can be actually standing and lifting your legs from side to side in front of you, kind of like those hurdle stretches where they just swing their legs back and forth before a hurdle race. Just doing that slowly so that you're engaging all of those muscles instead of loosening them up. And then balance games are going to be a great option for that as well. So if you have a balance ball at home, Slack lining is great, or just practicing standing on one foot and swapping back and forth is a great way to strengthen that hip complex. Uh, we've talked about how important rest is. A component of rest is nutrition, giving your body the fuel that it needs to recover. 
One of the nice things about running is that you don't have to put as much pressure on yourself about what you're eating. And if that is something that you do regularly, you can take that pressure off. Um, that said, giving yourself protein is going to be a big part of that. You want your body to be able to rebuild. Uh, you shouldn't be judging yourself for everything that you're eating, but just be mindful of like, am I giving myself the tools that I need to be successful here? So making sure that you get some protein on board right after a run and a little bit of sugar and carbs in order to absorb that protein is going to be really helpful. While you're out on a run, if it, you're going over the hour up to two hour mark um, and beyond, every half hour or so, having a little bit of like an energy chew or a goo or something like that to keep your calories up and your blood sugar high so that you're able to make the right decisions while you're out on the trail, keep your balance is going to be good for during the run nutrition. Most people will get there eventually. And the most important nutrition to focus on is going to be post run and uh, rest nutrition so that you're rebuilding. And then stretching, icing, all of these uncomfortable things that help you do the uncomfortable thing of running, uh, which feels a little bit like a slap in the face. I went out and did the work to put in a run. And now I have to do more uncomfortable things in order to be able to do the run again tomorrow. But they're very, very important. And uh, you can talk to any runner. Often they struggle to uh, keep their practice high on these and keep following through on these uh, commitments, which are going to help. But they really do make a difference, especially as you're starting out and you're noticing some kind of hot areas while you're uh, building up your foundation. Ice, ice, ice is really going to be helpful. Your body will get inflamed as you are starting to stress new areas of it. And icing is going to help cut down on that inflammation, which will hurry along healing and growth. So you want to make sure that you're giving your body all the tools that it needs to do what it wants to do, which is run and get better at it. So talking about a training plan, then putting all of this together, it's helpful really to have a goal. And that goal could be finishing a race. It could be a time. Times are tough on trails because the conditions vary so much. A 5K on one trail is going to be wildly different from a 5K on another. So maybe your goal is to run a certain distance or climb a certain mountain or something like that. An altitude might be your goal or consistency. I want to get to the point where I'm running five days a week. All of those are great, wonderful options. You can be creative. Whatever it is that uh, is going to motivate you to get out the door that feels attainable, but like you're still pushing yourself and does have a time horizon on it just to help keep things a little bit more in focus. It's tough to reach a goal when you're like, at some point in the future, eventually I would like to be able to blank. Give yourself a, a timeline and that will help you just kind of give you the little extra kick in the butt that you might need to get out the door on the days where it's a little bit colder outside. That's what I really struggle with. If it's cold before I start running, I really need to work myself up into it. Once you have your goal, you're gonna start building in stages. You're gonna lay that foundation first. So that's gonna be a lot of slow miles um, at a pace where you can maintain a conversation with folks is usually kind of the sweet spot. Uh, if you're running faster to the point where you're kind of gasping between words, maybe back it off just a little bit. You're not running then at a pace that is either laying foundation or recovering. Uh, you're starting to push yourself into an anaerobic zone, which is where you're building muscle instead of endurance, which is fine, but probably not what you want to do for the foundational part. Especially during that foundation building, you're going to want to make sure that you're doing your hip exercises. You're going to want to make sure that you're paying attention to potential problem areas and addressing those early. Because once you start getting higher in volume and intensity, you really want to have that foundation well laid. It's much more difficult to treat a hip injury or a hip weakness after you've already got shin splints or a knee problem than it is to do that proactively to avoid it. Uh, thinking about working up to our goal then, we can start fine tuning into our skills after you've laid that foundation. These are going to be runs that focus on, uh, depending on what your goal is, being able to run up the hill faster. So you're gonna find a place to do hill repeats and that's working on particular skills that are gonna help come together to meet your particular goal. Uh, maybe that's the skill of being able to run for a long time. So go out slower than you normally do, but just trying to run for as at the longest time that you're able to. That's also a skill and it's as much mental as it is physical. So thinking about which skills you wanna kind of build and develop in order to meet that goal, in starting to incorporate those once you've got it 
firm foundation so that they can actually uh, kind of take hold. And then as you're getting closer to the point where you're actually ready to realize that goal, you're gonna start fine tuning. And that might be a little bit more intensity uh, from each run, might be running more frequently. Uh, generally speaking, this is where your volume and your intensity of the workout, so speed or distance are gonna be the highest. And then right before it's time to try and reach your goal, that's about the peak of your training, you're gonna to wanna to give yourself a little bit of a break so your body can put itself back together. Generally, that takes about two weeks for your body to adapt from the training that it's had. So about two weeks out from your goal, you're gonna dial back the training. You're just gonna do enough to maintain the fitness that you have and give your body the window that it needs to recover there. This is what's called peaking. You're gonna to wanna to make, you're gonna try and get it so that your fitness and uh, your ability is at the highest peak right when you're ready to uh, meet your goal. That takes practice, um, but generally speaking, if you know when your goal is going to be uh, lived out, giving yourself two weeks before that to start dialing back the mileage, uh, cutting down to the point where you're still active, you're still, you're not losing any fitness, but you're not actively trying to build new skills into that um, is gonna be kind of the window that you wanna shoot for. And then again, we're balancing consistency with flexibility. We're listening to our body, making sure that if there's an issue that we notice coming up for us, that we're addressing that early and often. Uh, and if that means that you need to adjust your training plan, maybe you dial back the mileage for that week then to something lower than you were expecting, that's okay. Doing what it takes to be on a continual path of growth as opposed to starting and stopping is going to be much more helpful in the long term than going at it too hard and realizing that you actually need to completely shut down in order to recover from a pretty serious injury. So we talked about, goodness gracious, last, last logistical point is uh, where and when you're going to be going. Big part of trail running is that you get to explore new areas and uh, have hopefully some new experiences with new people. Uh, that means that you're going to need to know where to go. Good Lord. PowerPoint. A few resources, a yeah, few resources for you that will be useful for that. Uh, there's an app from REI called the Trail Running Project. This is a crowdsourced app where people record runs that they've gone on, let you know some of the details about that trail and what it will be like to be running on it. Uh, it's a really great resource, especially as you're exploring a new area. Any book of fun hikes to do in a given area is also essentially a trail running book because any trail that you can hike, you can probably run. So checking those out. Uh, races in the area, even if they're ones that you're not interested in competing in, can let you know a cool part of the area to go running in. Um, and that can be an exciting way to uh, explore some challenging terrain or just a new space that you haven't been before. Um, and last, just talking to people. Local clubs are a great resource for uh, folks and they generally have the knowledge of the area to give you a kind of a gradated uh, vision of what you're getting into, let you know based off of your ability level, what you're getting into and help you find the run that's gonna be right for you. And that uh, on a more granular level is just local people. helps a lot to have a running buddy where you can get out at least once a week with someone else uh, and enjoy your time together. That helps with consistency on a training aspect and it's also just a more fun way of going through it. That's kind of a whirlwind tour of uh, trail running and if you have any questions now uh, feel free to fire them off in the chat. Um, see what there's still that one down there. Um, so I left some time at the end for questions and if there aren't any, then you're free to go. And if you do have some questions that you'd like me to answer, then now would be the time to fire them my way. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And if you are interested in trying out any of the things that we talked about today, the expo is a great time to come in and talk to one of our footwear specialists about getting the right pair of shoes or uh, checking out clothing to make sure that you've got the comfortable gear that's gonna help you get out and enjoy your time outside instead of just suffering through it. So thank you for that. And 
I also apologize because it does have a bit of a delay between when people put questions down in the chat versus when I'm able to see them. So if you're asking questions, it might take just a minute to respond. And to the person who asked uh, questions about how many miles can you get out of running shoes, um, did I answer that question sufficiently or would you like more detail? See, we've got another person popping in. Um, welcome to uh, the trail running introduction. Uh, we're at the question and answer portion of the presentation. So if you have any questions that you'd like me to go over in the last 15 minutes or so that we have for the presentation, feel free to drop those in the chat. Where do I like to run locally? That's a great question. Uh, so Minneapolis and the Twin Cities in general are a great place, running groups and meetups. Awesome, cool. Uh, Twin Cities are a great place to do your running. The park system here is really well uh, funded and they do a lot of uh, things with their websites so that make it very easy to find stuff. A um, few of my favorite places, I like really to run in the Minnesota River Bottoms or the Mississippi River Bottoms down south of Bloomington. It's just a, a quick out and back trail. You can go out about uh, three miles, turn around, come back so for a six mile run, and that's all on single track, or it'll connect with uh, an asphalt path that continues going down, uh, just kind of following the length of the river down. That's one of my favorite places to go when I need a convenient spot. I also really like going up to Afton State Park, a little bit northeast of the cities. Uh, they've got a lot of trails out there and it's really varied terrain. So if you're looking to do some stuff with hills, that's a great place to do it. The trails there are more designed for uh, like cross country skiing in the winter. So it's not as much single track and you're not gonna have as much variation with like rocks and things like that to, to deal with. Um, but you're going to be able to have a lot of fun with the incline and decline and you're not going to have to think about am i going to trip and fall on my face while i'm out here those are a couple of my favorite spots uh Feudor worth has a lot of trails that are both paved and are uh, dirt and you can just kind of knit together a long run out there as often as you want to um other good resource for that is looking into any place where you cross-country ski in the winter or where people you know cross-country ski in the winter uh, generally, you're going to have a uh, good infrastructure to support running while you're out there in the off season for the ski set, for the ski time. They do get upset with you if you go running once they've uh, laid down snow. So bear that in mind. Uh, for running groups and meetups, uh, obviously in COVID time, that's a little bit more ch of a challenge. Uh, one group that's a lot of fun to get out with is the Collegeville Track Club in the cities. Uh, they have pretty wide range of folks. A lot of folks were former college runners. And so if you're looking for a competitive edge, uh, they have a lot of folks who are training for stuff in particular, and you can have a good training buddy. They're also just really excited to run. And wherever you are uh, fitness wise or in your experience with running, they're a great resource to talk to and find a running buddy uh, or just a group that goes out on a regular basis to, to run. A couple of the running specialized of uh, the specialized running stores in the cities also have uh, their own running groups. So the uh, Mill City Running has uh, their own running groups and you can get connected with them. Uh, that's the one that I know best. Uh, and I would start with either Collegeville or Mill City. And if those aren't good fits for you, then they would be able to uh, kind of point you in the right directions outside of that. And then another question of. How often would you recommend getting new running shoes? Uh, 
really that's going to depend on mileage more than it is on time. So if you're going out a couple days a week and for four or five miles every time that you go, and that's as much as you're doing, then you, those shoes should last you, let's see, 10 miles a week. Those shoes could last you the whole year um, if you're running about that volume. If you're running closer to like a 50 mile week, which is a, a pretty decent training load, then you start looking closer to like every four to five months. Um, but usually it's going to be more based off of mileage. So a really well built out running shoe um, that are designed for kind of high mileage running. Those generally last between five and 600 miles of running. For a lighter weight shoe, like the one that we were looking at earlier, um, this is still a really high quality shoe. It is just built to be lighter weight, which means that it's going to wear out faster. And that's going to last between two and 300 miles. Um, so especially if you're uh, looking at getting a new pair of shoes, asking the person that you're working with uh, what kind of mileage they're built for is going to be a helpful indicator for how often you sh should switch that out. That's kind of the rule of, th of thumb. If you're noticing that there's a really heavy wear area, and if, especially if you've gotten through the rubber and into the foam bed of the shoe, that's probably a good sign that you need to swap shoes into something that's going to be able to support you in a more predictable way. Once you get into the foam, you start tearing away at that very quickly, and then you're landing on a more and more unstable surface. So being aware that that's going on uh, might be an important indicator as well. Also, if your body is starting to, to break down with that pair of shoes, might be time to get a new, new pair. Uh, for me, and this varies from person to person, but it can be a, a good question just to be checking in on. Uh, for me, that usually looks like getting a lot of soreness in my shins and starting to get more and more acute while I'm running. Uh, that's usually an indicator that I'm nearing the end of my shoe's lifespan and that it might be time to, to re-up. Um, good questions. Thank you. Uh, any other ones for the last 10 minutes? And also if I uh, left some stuff on the table and you'd like to learn more about that uh, and ask follow-ups, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, other places that I like to run locally, these are less of uh, conventional trail runs, but the, the greenways and the parkways in the cities have been great. There's no vehicle traffic that you have to compete with, and uh, usually people are, are pretty nice. It's, even when it's uh, really busy, you can still find enough space and communicate well enough to be able to find some distanced ways <laughs> to get around folks. Um, that said, I recommend going to like Lake of the Isles, Chain of Lakes area, maybe earlier in the morning or later in the evening because people do tend to uh, block there and it can be kind of crowded uh, around like four to six in the afternoon or like eight to 10 in the morning, tend to be pretty, pretty busy times there. But I do like it, it's fun out there. Um, if you're looking for some runs that are a little bit further out from the cities, there's a few options for that as well. Rochester area is a, has a really nice trail system that's built up. Traction in the winter, awesome. Minimize slipping and falling, great. Good question. Um, form is going to be really helpful with that. If you're well balanced, then you're going to be able to adapt quicker to slippery situations. I talked earlier about having a kind of a shorter stride, thinking about between 150 to 180 beats per minute. Um, that's going to make it so that you're taking short enough steps that if you do slip, you've got another foot coming down quickly to, to stabilize. For traction, I run in trail shoes on the roads during the winter, just so that I have extra lugs that I can bite into the snow. Those may or may not be helpful when it's like really, really icy. Once it gets to be icy, I just throw on a pair of uh, micro spikes. So uh, there's a variety of different traction devices that you can get. Uh, Yak tracks are probably the best known, which have kind of a plastic tube that's wrapped with a spring. And those just kind of with elastic get around your shoe. I don't particularly like those ones for running because the activity is so high impact. Those plastic tubes tend to break pretty quickly. Uh, so I go for something that is uh, usually built with either small chains or uh, a pretty durable rubber that goes down there. Um, we have a few different options for that around here. 
Um, and you can get as advanced as things that look like just mini crampons, those mountain climbing claws that you put on your foot. Those I recommend for if you're doing a lot of stuff off pavement and on uh, really uncertain uh, natural surfaces. If you're gonna be doing some mixed stuff on pavement and off, then I would go with something that's, uh, like I said, the micro spikes, which are usually just kind of, if you think of a studded tire for a car, looks like that. And there's just kind of a rubber gasket that gets put onto the sole of the shoe. And that handles really well. Uh, it does feel a little bit constricting on the foot, but that's because it's doing its job and it adds a bit of weight. But uh, especially like February, January, when it was just like sheer everywhere, those were a lifesaver for me. Um, as I was getting out on the greenways in particular. Good questions. Um, the other nice thing that I like about trail running is that you can set it up in a way that for your goal setting as a way to go explore a new area that you were maybe needing an excuse <laughs> to get out to. Um, so my dog who's conked out under the table and i we just got back from a camping trip up on the sht we spent a couple days up there uh just driving along the sht dropping off uh the road whenever we wanted to and going for a run out from the state parks it's a really cool way to explore some of northern minnesota which i'm from montana and didn't have a lot of time to get out there which i i uh, really enjoyed thank you you're welcome uh we got about five minutes left, so if there's any other questions, you're uh, welcome to ask. Um, I can also see if you're still in the room, so feel no pressure <laughs> to stay whatsoever, and I'll, I'll stick around as long as people are asking questions. Thanks so much for coming. Really appreciate it. If you do go up on the SHT right now, it's, it's muddy. I'll, I'll let you know that, uh, so bring some some fresh socks afterward. It was very cold some of those nights, but it was a good time. The mud adds to a bit of the fun there. See just a couple people sitting around. Um, if there are any other questions, let me know. And don't feel pressured to come up with a question here. Free to go whenever. I'm paid to be here and you're not, so don't worry about that. Good deal. Well, seeing no further questions, I'll say thank you once again for coming. Uh, if you've got questions that uh, occur to you later on, you know where to find us here in Cedar Riverside. Feel free to stop by and hope you all have a good day and get to stay dry in the, the rainy season out there. We'll talk to you all 